good evening or good afternoon. Uh, I'm, uh, even though it's the Hebrew Academy, uh, we, I'm sorry, but, but the language here will be English. And uh, I can translate it to Hebrew for those who would like to have it in the original. Um, well, it's a great occasion. And uh, I think we can feel quite comfortable because we all know each other and the person who is sitting here in the second row, in case nobody noticed, um, who is the cause for this uh, gathering, friend gathering, um, will start by uh, uh, giving uh, Dr. Asaf Maron the option to congratulate and to bring uh, greetings from far and away and from many people who couldn't take part in this okay, issue. And uh, later on, I will just call the people who are going to present, but I suppose that we'll not be sitting here as we would like to hear and watch uh, the PowerPoint. So let's start. Good afternoon, dear Yoel, dear Rika, dear family, dear colleagues, dear guests. I am honored to participate in this honorary symposium for Yoel Rak here at the Israeli Academy of Sciences and Humanities. For several decades now, medical students, and not many years ago, I was lucky enough to be among them. At the Sackler School of Medicine at Tel Aviv University, have been meeting Professor Yoel Rack primarily as their anatomy teacher in their first year. Still equipped with his drawing chalk and classical anatomical charts, and only seldom with PowerPoint presentations, Rack's method of anatomy gained much popularity over the years, whether he was using a model of an upside down table to illustrate the basic framework of the sphenoid bone, or leading the students through the mysterious complexities of the peritoneal ligaments. As a professor of human anatomy, he always insisted that all bodily systems and organs are equally represented in the anatomy course curriculum, not only the ones that have unequivocal clinical significance. His students' comments at the end of the course repeated themselves every year in stating that even the dullest parts of the material became fascinating topics and that what they remember most of all are the evolutionary correlations Yoel frequently adds to his lectures. In doing so, he reminds his students that human anatomical structure is but one example of vertebrate anatomy and constantly encourages them to think beyond the definition of their textbooks. Naturally, it follows that during the long years he had served as chair of the Department of Anatomy and Anthropology, he also insisted that anatomy should be taught to medical students mainly through the traditional dissection of what he terms the best atlas, dissection of the human cadaver. In his own words to first year medical students, the efforts a student makes in the strenuous and often frustrating process of searching for an anatomical structure are at the heart of studying anatomy, far more important than the mere act of identifying or finding it. According to Yoel, there exists a reliable correlation between a student's knowledge of anatomy and how stained her laboratory coat is at the end of a dissection. Along these lines, it may be said that the, phys the physician, sensu stricto, may be thought of as a highly trained technician 
who must memorize protocols for diagnosis and treatment. The physician Sensu Lato is an educated and well-informed professional equipped with thorough knowledge of all the basic sciences, anatomy included. Yoel's pedagogical principles, well expressed in both his lectures and active participation in curricular committees, most certainly adhere to the latter. His approach to the anatomical sciences has made it feasible for scores of medical students to study, but also to love studying anatomy. Echoing some beloved phrases from Anton Chekhov's A Boring Story, told by none other than an anatomy professor. One of Yoel's favorite, favorite quotes goes like this. And we proceed in the following order. In front walks Nikolai with the I come after him, and after me, his head humbly lowered strikes the cart horse. Or else, if necessary, a cadaver is carried in first. After the cadaver walks Nikolai, and so on. In my appearance, is rise, then sit down, and the murmur of the sea suddenly grows still. Scholars of today's academic world are highly specialized. Whether their research interests are the three-dimensional architecture of a transmembrane channel or the effect of a drug on gene expression, they keep refining their line of work in the face of a rapidly increasing rate of knowledge expansion, this tendency may very well be an unavoidable outcome and arguably has many advantages. However, one disadvantage that I think must not be overlooked is the price the scientific world pays for this high level of specialization. And I'm referring, of course, to the increasing dearth of scholars with broad spectrum knowledge and the ensuing ability of integration both within and between scientific disciplines. One study even demonstrates how scientists view broad projects as riskier and less important than deeper ones. Too many students, beginning scholars and colleagues, Yoel has always represented a unique example to the contrary. His broad knowledge of human anatomy and deep acquaintance with the fossil record, but also his vast knowledge of the animal world in geology, geography, and archaeology has allowed him to explore almost any part of the skeleton, from ear ossicles and the osseous labyrinth to the pe pelvic girdle, from the finest details of dental anatomy the facial masks of the robust Australopithecines and the Neanderthals. To put it in Henigian terms, connecting the dots of Rack's professional accomplishments reveals the central motif of his search for characters, character states, and their positions along the morphoclines of each trait. Rack is simply fascinated by them. In his view, every character counts, and its use is legitimate in the process of reconstructing phylogenies. In the debate between the anagenetic and cladogenetic views of evolution, even the adaptive values conferred by anatomical structures, which themselves are the outcomes of one's understanding of said anatomy, even those were recruited by Rack as characters of no less significance than the anatomical traits themselves. The squamosal suture of A. boisei and the Neanderthal face are cases in point. Rack's appreciation of genetic evidence in the form of DNA sequences as additional, albeit discrete characters that are by no means superior to anatomical traits is probably the best example for my argument. In other words, his loyalty to the scientific game rules and his natural curiosity are the two main driving forces behind the process of his scientific thought and academic achievements. This is in fact what enabled him to present mandibular evidence in support of the premise that Neanderthals do not play a role 
in modern human ancestry. Along the same lines, he later pointed to gorilla-like anatomy on Ea forensis, suggesting an evolutionary link between Ea forensis and the robust Australopiths. In both cases, this was done elegantly by employing the rules of cladistic analysis and the logic of parsimony. Rack's interest in characters and their status, their, the character states along the primitive derived axis should be viewed here as stemming from the high potential he ascribes to them in falsifying or corroborating a suggested phylogeny. In short, you see, Yoel is a man of character. And as my previous notes would have suggested to you by now, not only cladistic ones. And now a few words about the elephant in the room. In early 2013, Erela and I embarked on the project of editing a volume in Yoel's honor, thinking that the occasion of his 70th birthday would be an excellent opportunity to, to celebrate his numerous achievements in science and wish him many more, as well as the many friendships he has made throughout the years. The volume we edited presents a collection of original papers contributed by many of Yoel's friends and colleagues from all over the globe many of whom have collaborated with their students, thus keeping the flame burning, so to speak. We wish to thank all 33 authors who contributed to the volume, as well as to dozens of colleagues who kindly agreed to act as reviewers of the papers we received. We also wish to thank our colleagues who kindly agreed to deliver short talks today. Where is the book, you ask? Well, in progress. We were aiming for this occasion and hoping that we would be able to present you all with the first copy of the volume, but production was held back more than anticipated and the volume is still in the making. We hope to be able to present it to you, Yoel, in a few months. In the meantime, you'll have to take our word for it and you should believe it because Erela and I read each paper many, many times. The papers in the volume touch upon diverse ways of thinking about human evolution. Many of these approaches are among the topics that you have been studying through your productive career. Special thanks go to the president of the Israeli Academy of Sciences and Humanities, Professor Nili Cohen, to Professor Yosef Kaplan, chairperson of Division of Humanities at the Academy, who apologized for not having been able to come here today, and to Galia Finzi, for all their help in preparation of this event. Last, but not least, certainly not least, I would like to thank a dear colleague, friend, and the co-editor of Joel's Festschrift, Professor Erela Hovers. Her knowledge, experience, and exceptional professionalism, all to learn from, have made this beautiful project an enjoyable one from its outset. Thank you very much. <laughs>